with me, Richard Reeves, uh, and also to a new season of, of Dialogues. I don't really know what a season is, but uh, it sounds much better than I just took a break, a slightly longer one than, than I planned. So welcome back to regular listeners and welcome to new listeners and do check out the back catalog for, for those who are new. I have some great guests lined up for this season of Dialogues and starting today with Erica Bakioki. Erica is a legal scholar specializing in equal protection law and a feminist legal theory as well as Catholic social teaching and sexual ethics. She's a, a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and also a senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute where she directs the Wallstonecraft uh, project and uh, Wallstonecraft is a big part of our conversation today. Our discussion centers mostly on Erica's new book, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision in which she argues for a form of feminism that takes into account the natural differences between men and women, especially in what uh, she calls reproductive asymmetry. What that means is that having sex and especially having children carry very different implications, she argues, for men and women. We talk about her journey from a Bernie Sanders supporting kind of feminist to a Roman Catholic kind of feminist, including a strong pro-life moral basis. Her intellectual heroine is the 18th century thinker Mary Wollstonecraft, who had a feminist vision that Erica argues was all about the, the equal pursuit of, of the good, about virtue. And she contrasts that with John Stuart Mill's uh, feminism, which was based on a, a perfect equality, the idea of this more symmetry between uh, men and, and women. And we agree and disagree about some of that. We also talk about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, what she got right and what Erica thinks she got wrong, whether conservatives should be supporting uh, President Biden's big expansion of family welfare plans, the Texas abortion law, family-friendly policy, and, and much more. I should say that at the very beginning of the conversation, Erica talks very candidly about her own troubled childhood uh, and early adulthood, and uh, in her darkest hours, that led her to thoughts of suicide. Overall, it was a, a rich and, and lively timely conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Erica Bakioki, welcome to Dialogues. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I really, really got a lot out of uh, reading your book um, and the way in which you combine legal history, politics, ethics, etc. was just terrific. And I find, I think there's gonna be lots we can talk about here. So um, thank you so much for, for joining me. But I think just before we get into the the substance of the conversation. Can you just describe a little bit how you ended up in, in this line of work? It's fascinating. You've got this Wallstone Craft project now. You're a think tanker. You're obviously a legal scholar. What's the, what's the, what's the Erica journey to this place? Well, the journey is a long one, I guess, as it is for all of us, um, you know, professionally and personally. And I think I do have to really start with the personal um, because it certainly impacted my thinking um, right from the get-go. And that is that um, my mom was actually married and divorced three times by the time I reached my 19th birthday. And so by like 13 years old, I was kind of acting out in um, what you would know is all the kind of textbook ways, um, you know, alcohol, drugs, boys, that kind of thing. And I really had no relationship with my father um, after my parents divorced when I was four. So I was a a pretty gifted athlete, more than more than a, a student um, at that point. But I had just a lot of anxiety, depression, um, even you know thoughts of kind of suicide. Um, and I had these two kind of pivotal events that happened in my life, um, and they both had to do with friends of mine who took their own lives. So one, when I was sixteen, um, launched me into kind of I guess you could say like the self help movement, um, kind of 12 step recovery programs, when I was really young, I mean, imagine 16, 17 year old in those rooms daily. Um, and, and then after I had kind of taken that course for a while, a very close friend of mine, you know, who I kind of had imagined marrying or something like that. Um, he took his life when he was 19. And I was 19. And we had spent a lot of time during that summer. And it was just crushing to me. And so that too, kind of sent me even further down, but even, um, kind of more into existential questions, I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I always kind of, the way I describe it is that um, the 12 steps had given me this kind of guide for living that was um, that was really kind of bringing me along um, to more peace, I would say, but had not given me kind of a, 
I don't know, a, count, a, a worldview at all, sort of um, an intellectual way to think about um, the world. And so I had um, arrived at Middlebury College, a real liberal school in, in Vermont, and I right away um, found my way to the Women's Center on campus. And so I became um, really active in the Women's Center there, uh, kind of one of the leaders, and then also was enrolled in a lot of women's studies classes. Hmm. And so this is when, because I was really, um, I was kind of not drawn at all to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll culture anymore. I had kind of been there, done that, and seen how it had really been harmful to me, at least. You got, you got all that in early. Most people do it yeah, at college, I, but you just <laughs> done it in high school. That's right. Great. <laughs> I'd, done it, I'd done it really early. Um, and I so I started doing things like I volunteered for Bernie Sanders one summer. I really became very kind of riveted by what I was studying, called myself kind of a socialist feminist at that point. But what ended up happening is because I was really also having this kind of, you know, personal kind of existential questions going on because of those really kind of momentous things that had happened in my young life from the divorces to the suicides and all that, that I began to really resist what I was learning in my classes. And so I guess you could say there's this kind of express linkage in modern feminism between kind of the feminist quest for freedom and equality, which I was totally on board with, but what, with basically like the free love kind of mm. philosophy of the sexual revolution, you would say. And I just began to sort of see that I, I thought that, that, that equality and liberty for women was much better conjoined with my own kind of increasingly skeptical views of the then really rampant hookup culture on campus. And I just, to me, it seemed like free love was never, for women at least, free. And I saw this mm. in my friends, you know, walking out of kind of one night stands, that women seemed more attached when they were engaging in sex. And what I came to see when I started reading more of the literature is that really because of hormones blazing through us, right. sex is, is different. the truth. For me. Yeah, sex, sex is, is different, different for, for men and women. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I, so, I, basically, so you, you weren't, you, just to, sorry to interrupt, you weren't a Catholic, yeah. were you Roman Catholic at this point? Or did, yeah, no. did, did so your, femi that, your feminism, your feminism, sort of preceded your Catholicism. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. So I was baptized Catholic, but we, you know, I think we stopped going to church after the second divorce, after my first communion or something. And I was not raised in at all a Catholic home with my mother. Um, and so it is kind of odd that I end up in the Catholic church because as a women's studies student um, and a real, you know, feminist advocate at that time, but was obviously very pro-choice. I really thought the Catholic Church was like, you know, <laughs> the worst kind of institution on earth. Um, I, if I, you know, I kind of knew of, um, you know, their care for the poor and that type of thing. But I just um, found their views on sex, at least at first, um, abortion, things like that, really kind of anathema to my own way of thinking. So it took me a long time to get there. And that's its own story, I doubt, which you want to hear all of. Um, part of, though, I have to, you know, say at the outset is just, that the 12 step meetings had really taught me how to pray. And so prayer was really, really fundamental in all of this. And the way I was taught to pray was really on my knees. I mean, that's what I was taught. And so there was sort of this, even though I never identified it as Christian in the start, there was something going on that really was tugging me to be in conversation with God much of the day. And so it, I think at that point gave me a lot of courage to question things that were just basic to the, I would say, casual sex culture on campus. And so that's kind of the end of things is that I really just started to see that exactly as you put it, that men and women are really unequal when it comes to sex. And I guess I would say that my scholarship kind of followed from there. But the intermediate step, which is important, is that I um, really changed, you know, changed my major, started to study political philosophy. Um, I did continue on a little bit of women's studies, but um, and really got in, it really interested in philosophy, started studying pre-modern philosophy, especially, you know, the ancients, Plato, Aristotle. Um, and I think that really moved me intellectually to think about these things in a very, very different way than um, mm. the culture at large was thinking about them. So, in, so interesting. And that, then I can see how that leads you into legal scholarship and into, uh, into a position as a sort of policy wonk slash legal scholar slash philosopher, which is a, a great combination, I will say. But it's very interesting to me that I didn't know that story about you, and I have this, I have this, uh, I have this theory, which I, I guess is almost empirically tested. And my theory is that people who end up being more socially conservative in their political persuasions, particularly this, I'm thinking here about public intellectuals in particular, are much more likely to have come from troubled childhoods, uh, perhaps because they they can see the value of it. So I can think of quite a few people. Uh, J. D. Vance is a great example, but I can think of other people in my orbit as well who will very often say, look, I'm a social conservative. And here was my childhood. Here was my, you know, my background. And the liberals I know, 
uh, including myself, and I'm using liberal here in more of the, the sort of million sense, all came from incredibly stable, loving families. Uh, now, I say all, but uh, so I have this it's an empirical question, which is, is it possible that those of us who are very who are more on the side of a kind of autonomy and free expression and you can trust individuals to do their thing and so on are the ones who've had the benefit of a really stable and loving upbringing and the people who are saying hold on hold on i'm really worried about families and so on is because they've come from a more uh you know more troubled background but it just strikes me among my own friends right some really sort of strong liberals and i even work i worked for nick clegg uh liberal democrat prime minister you know, great family loving stable family background and so i wonder if in some ways there's this almost weird relationship between family stability and a strong community giving you uh, a worldview which allows you to be liberal and family instability in a difficult community gives you a worldview that actually makes you much more question question that value. I don't know. It's just something that's kind of... Yeah, you know... I've never said it out loud before, so I don't... I yeah, have no yeah, idea. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I think empirically, I would say that's true of some of my friends, but not true at all of others. So I know many, yeah. many, many, many social conservatives who come from really, really outstanding families. Um, so I don't, I don't know that you could find that it's empirically true. However, I think there is something to be said for what, what you're claiming. And, you know, I know we'll get to John Stuart Mill soon, but it really makes sense of kind of his approach of things that he says at some point, you know, we never could get to this view of equality that he, or sorry, view of liberty that he has without at, you know, first coming to the place where people are, you know, responsible, would be responsible right. with that liberty. And you really sees kind of the family is doing that work. So I, I do think what you say could be partially true, but I don't know that everybody who's so mm. conservative comes from, from no, a no. poor background. I do no, think no, that maybe. you're right, though, that there are many of us who do. Maybe it's a claim about the public intellectuals, the people who are sort of moved who moved to act in this in this space. But um, well, thank you for that background, and uh, really that does help to situate the the conversation. I think so. This book, which I, as I said, is very very rich. You you start with Mary Wollstonecraft, and in some ways she runs all the way through, and her tradition, and then that you know, you're ending up with Glendon at the end, and we'll get we'll get to all of that. But I think it'd be helpful for some people to just get a brief sketch of Wollstonecraft and. What, what her approach to women's rights is, because I think she, she provides an intellectual foundation for much of, of what follows. So he is she, who, who was she? Uh, what did she say? And what do you find attractive about her vision, I guess, is the question. Yeah, so she's, you know, a late 18th century British philosopher who has only become, I would say, a canonical, recognized as a canonical philosopher in the recent in recent decades. I think in large part to, you know, many women um, political theorists, you know, entering the academy and really wanting to resurrect her work. Um, for a long time, she was, I think, really dismissed um, for a number of reasons. One is, you know, a... a um, a biography that came out about her from her mm. um, husband, William yeah. Godwin, short-lived husband, William Godwin, that sort of, you know, soured her reputation in her country, uh, you know, among her countrymen. Um, otherwise, I think she was also just sort of dismissed as like a, you know, a Lockean individualist or even um, kind of like Paine. I mean, she ran in the circles with Tom Paine um, at uh, the point of the French Revolution. She's just thought of as a French revolutionary. So, you know, that all went sour. So, <laughs> you know, Burke was right. And therefore, why listen to Wollstonecraft? And so I think we just sort of don't pay, we didn't pay a lot of attention to her. We didn't actually read her writing. I mean, I think about when I read her as a women's studies student, I actually went back when I read her um, more recently. Uh, I went back and um, and read what I had, you know, read and, and really it was excerpts of her work that was mainly focused on her views on education. And so that's how we think of her is that she wanted, a, you know, equal education for boys and girls. And isn't that great? We now have that. So we don't really have to think about her anymore. Right. And I think mm. what's fascinating is that she um, her vision is so much more kind of capacious and robust than just those things that you know, most women in Western um, democracies have now attained, right, in terms of, of rights of education, entry into the professions. Um, she didn't talk too much about the, the franchise, but certainly political civil rights, um, she certainly wanted as well. And so we think we've attained those. And so we don't need to pay attention. But there's this underlying um, foundation, moral vision for her understanding of rights. And in a nutshell, it's really that rights exist in order to fulfill our responsibilities because she thinks we're a certain kind of um of being you know human beings are a certain kind of being and they're rational creatures who are created by and responsible to god and so you know for her rights aren't conceived of as kind of um 
you know, abstract kind of tools mm-hmm. of self-creation as we as we sort of see in, in later theorists. But they're really in order to fulfill our duties. And why is that? Well, because duties are kind of the first, I would say, reality of human beings. She really understood in a way that her fellow Enlightenment thinkers didn't that we have these concrete obligations to one another. And that's really the first reality. You know, she kind of dismissed, I think, state of the state of nature theorists for their living in kind of abstraction um, and not recognizing um, those real duties. And that that really, in order to attain happiness, um, that we need to uh, fulfill those duties of state, whatever they are, in a way um, that leads us and you know those around us to, to lives of virtue and, hap- and and wisdom. And so those were mm-hmm. kind of what she saw as the ends. And I you know say that she combines kind of this pre-modern and modern approach because she certainly wanted equality and liberty in a way that was also true of the moderns, right? But she has a view of the human person that is much more pre-modern. You know, she sees self mastery is necessary in order to um, got you know use one's reason to guide one pa- one's passion otherwise we're like brute animals if we're just following our passions you know she would very much disagree with Hume who said reason you know is just um, uh, uh, you know for for the passions. passions for the slave of the passions then. reasons a slave of the passions yeah I think um, uh, well let's maybe get into some of the differences between her and in Mill who's who's my subject and who you use almost as a counterpoint. To Wollstonecraft, and I agree with your reading of her to the extent that I have read her, and I, I, I agree we tend to read you know excerpts of her and have a view of her as a person rather than a, perhaps of her thought. That she's really about the why. Right? So it's not just what rights should we have, but why should we have them? And so she's a, she's egalitarian and a feminist because she wants women to have the same opportunities as men to develop in excellence and and virtue, right? Uh, and and these laws are getting in the way of that. But it's not so. In other words, rights and equality are means to an end for for her. And and I think you'd agree with that characterization. I think that so when we turn to Mill, who you see as someone who uh, promotes a kind of individualist pro autonomy, it's you know more about the individual. Uh, approach and this perfect symmetry. So let's get in. This is a good way to get into the gender thing, I think, too. So Mill says we want perfect equality. He doesn't say symmetry. He says perfect equality legally, economically, and socially between men and women. And Wollstonecraft doesn't quite go there, uh, and nor do some of the people who follow in her train, because they say, well, we're not the same. Uh, we can't have perfect equality, or rather the imposition of perfect equality would actually end up being being unequal. I will say that I think to some extent, I don't think we get dug in on this, I, I think that Mill and others of his ilk, uh, that their moral views are sometimes understated in this kind of binary, right? Mill said we're all under moral responsibility to improve our moral character. He, he couldn't stop talking about the importance of cultivation of character and the role of family and the importance of parents and, and so on and, and ongoing commitments to each other. So I do think sometimes we can probably, we can ov- overdo it. That's my sort of brief defense uh, of Mill. I think there is more of an ethical... Um, formulation uh, at the heart of Mill's liberalism and perhaps you imply I'm happy for you to to dis- disagree but is that a, a, have I characterized the difference between them roughly accurately as you see it yeah no I think that that's that's perfectly right um, I think that you know as Mill says on in on liberty that you know the real focus is kind of on on the development of of individuality in terms of creativity, right? So he's really interested in inspiring genius, which I think is a great thing, right? Um, and I and as I talk about in the book, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg it really follows along very closely, I think, in this kind of million view. And it is very true. I mean, there's the great lines where um, that are just sort of missed, I think, in those who would take um, liberalism and sort of um, uh, forget about where he talks about responsibility in the family. So I have actually a quote here that I uh, prepared because I knew we were talking about Bill, but he ah. talks about mis- misplaced notions of liberty prevent moral obligation on the part of parents from being recognized and liberal, liberal, uh, sorry, legal obligations from being imposed. And I have an exclamation part he- point here. I don't know if that's mine or his. But so training in youth is really required, obviously, he, he thought for this kind of freedom. I think um, the tricky part is, is that for Wollstonecraft, there is a need for... Um, law to be involved in that too, because Mm. um, otherwise, you know, the critics of Mill would say that he was really parasitic on Christianity, you know, that he, as we kind of spoke about at the very outset, that, you know, he relied on uh, parents to do so. But, you know, if people just started deciding that their higher pleasures or their character would pull them away from, uh, you know, taking care of their children or something like that, 
um, you know, we needed law to be able to uh, to ensure that that people were fulfilling their obligations virtuously. And so, you know, by contrast, um, a Wollstonecraft, you know, talks about how she says a truly benevolent legislator always endeavors to make it the interest of each individual to be virtuous um, and private virtue becoming the cement of public happiness and orderly whole is consolidated by the tendency of all toward a common center. And she also talks about how, um, you know, society is not properly organized that does not compel men and women to discharge their respective duties. And I mm. think that kind of language would be a bit much for Mill, that he would yeah. really see that as the work of work of the family. Um, and then that's it. Really, we never want to have, you know, the state to the government being involved in, in the, even pushing custom. And so I think in that way, the complaint about Mill would be is that he's parasitic on on either Christian norms or just norms that are um, ensuring that kind of society as a whole is dedicated to the kinds of things he would want to see done in the family. Um, so I think yeah, there's a little yeah. naivety, I would say, about about that, you know. Um, and then, he, you know, he talks – I love subjection of women in so many ways. I think that he – his his uh, statement of the problem is excellent. I don't know that anyone would could disagree with it, you know. But he has this naivety about if we just kind of allow everything, if we leave it up to the market. Not he doesn't mean necessarily the economic market, but just allowing it to you know free choice that mm -hmm. things that women will choose to be mothers if they you know if they want to. Um, we ought not you know we never would have to force them because you know why you know we should just choose them if it's something natural or whatever. And I would say there is a way in which because of. Um, you know, our tendencies toward selfishness and those types of things that we do need to be pushed a bit of it, a little bit nudged is the current word, right, toward mm -hmm. our responsibilities as mothers and fathers. And that does have to come from the state. Well, that's an interesting distinction. I think that the um, so one one extreme view would be we're, we're atoms floating in a norm free, custom free environment, right? There's no all tradition, tradi you know, and this is the sort of straw man liberal in the in the writing of some conservatives you know patrick deneen and people like that just so sort of, they they they, they hit this complete straw man right that that, it, that liberals just hate traditions don't think we should have norms don't think we should have customs you know etc and we're floating free right or well, that would be the Hobbes. ideal right, right it's hot yeah, it, yeah it's Hobbes. Hobbes. although yeah no we no, could no, argue but we could argue though where we're, we were where we've gotten as a culture we wonder whether you know I think liberals like you like norms, but I think in the day, today oh, well, we're wondering don't worry. the kinds yeah. of norms. Yeah, <laughs> we are going to get to that. I'm, I'm sure we're going to. That, but, but that's just to like situate the argument. So you've got like floating free, and then you've got norms, traditions, customs, valuable, right? And, and Mill said it would be absurd to to pretend as if uh, there is nothing to learn from our ancestors, right? He was quite respectful of tradition. He just thought they could be revised in the light of new evidence and. Um, so we have traditions, we have norms, we have a culture which promotes certain things, um, uh, like well, some some of the things we've talked about. And then there's law, and then maybe and it's, it's a compelling, right? Um, which most liberals would agree with in certain cases. Do I think that parents are, should be compelled to you know, care for their children? Absolutely. Did Mill think that? Absolutely. Does the current law of the land assume that? Absolutely. But what it doesn't do, for example, except in a couple of states, is compel grown-up children to care for their elderly parents, right? There's a certain point where the law says, we'd like you to do that. And there's a strong norm of doing that. So if I discover, Erica, that you've got some parents that, you know, are, are in need and you're just ignore, completely neglecting them because you're worried, you're trying to make more money at Morgan Stanley or, or something. I'm, I'm being unfair to everybody right now. But right, I would, what would I think? I would think? I would think a lot less of you. I would think, and probably your husband would too, and your friends would, right? You'd think, you know, she's not a very nice person, neglecting her. But I wouldn't expect the law to come along and force you to go and look after your mom. I would, because you're a kid, because, you, because children are dependent. And so isn't that, I'm just throwing that out as a potential example of where we think, yeah, law's up to a certain point, but after that, it should be a norm. So I'm in favor of laws to make you look after your kids, and I'll take your kids if you don't live up to them and maybe put you in jail. Uh, I'm in favor of strong norms, and cultures that that encourage you strongly to look after your mom or your dad. Well, maybe given what you said at the beginning, maybe maybe this is a bad example, but um, but your elderly, you know, relatives. Um, but not laws. But I don't want a world where it's like no one cares about anybody. Mm -hmm. No, What's I think limit? that's fair. Is, is, it... is where does the law go? Right? How far does the right, law go? Right. Right. And these are the kinds of questions when you're sort of laying down principles that then have to get, you know, you get into the nitty gritty about how you're actually applying those 
Um, and so, I, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about abortion, but obviously those are the abortion, divorce are the kinds of places where we would probably disagree, you know, um, and, and because of exactly these kinds of reasons, you know, because it seems to me that the way you start thinking about um, responsibilities, um, you know, to lifelong marriage if, when at all, when, you know, at all possible rather than kind of a quick no fault divorce, which is allowed mm-hmm. in our country um, or the responsibilities to, you know, children, um, preborn children, you know, it, it re it restructures how norms work for all for, for others too, you know, and that's, I mean, I guess that's my, for in other situations. So when you allow kind of people to freely get out of, you know, promises that they've made quickly without um, requiring as, you know, European countries did at once, I'm not sure if they still do much more um, time waiting, you know, um, uh, or when you allow sort of abortion on demand, which of course in practice is not true of, in all of our jurisdictions, but is is the law right now. Um, there's a certain way in which you change the norms from being we are responsible for those who are vulnerable for our children, those kinds of things, mm-hmm. to something else. Um, you allow a sort of um, that kind of Hobbesian atomization to kind of creep in. And I think that is what ends up, that's what's happened since the sexual revolution is that I don't think that the, you know, there were certainly some sexual revolutionaries who probably had um, those kind of, those views, but for the, for the most part, people were of goodwill, but I think we've kind of um, lost our way in terms of what, con- you know, in terms of prioritizing rights to the detriment of our duties and responsibilities. I think we've forgotten the Wilsoncraftian vision, really, that that those responsibilities kind of that rights are there in order for us to fill up, fulfill our responsibilities, and that's kind of the 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 reason I wanted to um, you know introduce her her uh, yeah. way of thinking about rights again, because I think women are the ones women and the vulnerable are really the ones harmed by by a view that, um, you know, that, that kind of starts to mm. forget about the duties we have to the vulnerable. Well, I, th- I do want to get into some of the details of that in a moment. Maybe we'll switch to, to some of the legal cases and the, particularly in labor law. But I think as we're on this strand, let's, let's stay on it for a bit because I do, th- I think the difference here is between a world of chosen commitments and compelled commitments to use Wollstonecraft's view, uh, words. Um, and I think you're right. So a more liberal divorce law, for example, allows you legally to walk away from um, from a marriage. Um, and you, actually, what Mill said about this was that if you, particularly if there are children involved, that the law should allow for that. But that, but morally, this could be left to moral disapprobation in the proper sense of the term. Interesting, moral disapprobation or kind of customs and norms and so on. But by and large, you should be able to choose it. And so there's a situation where if people are able to choose what happens, and interestingly, you're kind enough to cite some of the work that I've done with some of my colleagues and an Atlantic essay I wrote about marriage, which is very interesting to see these very economically independent women with all the choices in the world, in the US, college-educated women, getting and staying married in greater numbers than their mothers were. And so they're reconstituting marriage as a chosen commitment around the shared determination to raise their kids together but they're doing so as a choice rather than as a result of being compelled and it's not clear to me ethically that that's worse and in fact in some ways i think you could ethically argue it's better right if you look after your mum or stay with your husband during the difficult times or or, or you know and i patiently raise my kids even though they drive me care like I, I, the fact that i'm choosing to do it doesn't seem to me to make it less ethically valuable. Arguably, it makes it more so. It's just that we've had this very difficult transition, and maybe we're having to kind of reconstitute these institutions of commitment based on choice rather than on compulsion. Yeah, and I guess I wouldn't say that it's only the law that would. The law just provides norms, and you know, as uh, Marion Glendon or really the classical legal tradition would say, is that the law is a teacher for helping people who don't yet have those who weren't raised in fam- a family like yours, you know, to understand that our responsibilities should be kept. Um, and, and, and so I think that that's why um, that becomes important. The other thing is that we do have elites, at least since, you know, who are speaking, I think, out of both sides of their mouth. So they're living a very, you know, neo-traditional in some ways. I don't mean neo-traditional as in, you know, moms are staying home or working part time, although that's true, too or you have part-time dads or whatever, um, but that they're really um, raising children is at the very center of their life, even if they have, you know, 
uh, successful careers along the side. They realize their responsibilities to their children are really important and that that lifelong marriage as, um, you know, uh, that it's dedicated to doing that and that they understand that having a man around, in fact, you know, the father of their children who's going to be the most intent on helping to raise those children um, really bodes well for everybody in the family, right? And so they're doing that with their own lives, but then there tends to be this way in which um, there's this idea that, oh, single motherhood is really fine because we don't want to, um, you don't want to, we don't want to, uh, uh, um, you know, impose a kind of value mm. judgment. And the, and the, and I mean, you know this in your work. I mean, Isabel Sawhill too. I mean, great, great work that's shown that marriage is the best place for raising children. And so we should be doing more, you know, as, you know, she did with teen pregnancy as, um, to really change the norms around it. And I think, um, I think things were headed there for both the left and the right. Um, and then, you know, we keep kind of, I don't know, running into, <laughs> running into disagreements, whether it was about gay marriage or now about other sorts of things where we can't just come together and vocally all say, you know, marriage is really good and let's focus on this, um, before we have children, um, um, and I would say, you know, yeah. trying to channel sexual behavior into into marriage is a is a admirable thing. Um, and so that's where, of course, I would disagree, especially with with you, where I don't think it's just, you know, as as Isabel says, um, drifting into parenthood, but it's also drifting into sex. And why is that bad? Because I think that tends to be really bad for women. Um, you know, it's kind of an expectation that, of course, we'll have sex whenever we desire Um but that tends to not be great for women who are pushing back on these casual sex norms. And I think mm. a lot of it really has to do with the differences in hormones, you know, men mm -hmm. with blazing testosterone, wanting, <laughs> wanting uh, the deed done and women with estrogen running through their bodies that causes them to have a lot more commitment, feelings of commitment or feelings, wanting commitment ahead of time because they have these feelings of attachment afterwards. And so they're raw from those kinds of sexual encounters. And we just don't want to talk about that as a, as a culture. Um, you know, well, I'm not naive to think that everybody's going to go get married before they have sex, you know, but I do no, think no. <laughs> there, the, the evidence um, shows that, you know, we could be doing more of that on both the left and the right, because we see these kinds of um, this kind of data about, about the harms of casual sex and commitment free sex to women. Well, I think, I mean, clearly you talk about the reproductive asymmetries and the differences between the sexes. And um, and I think it's interesting to think about, so my position, and it sounds like you've listened to my interview with Carol Hoover, or you've listened to some of the work around testosterone, but that on the one hand, so if people on the left kind of claim that there are no biologically based differences in the psychology of men and women around sex, then I can't talk to them really. I'm just okay. Go go and read some books, you know, first, and then we'll talk because it's clearly not true. And also, everybody who's actually in the world, who's actually lived in the world for more than five minutes right, as an adult, right. like, no, knows <laughs> that's not true. So it's like okay. So apart from the scientists and every normal person, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think it's questions like how far does the difference go? Like how far and uh, how far can you take those differences uh, between men and women and enshrine, or should you? and enshrine them in law, and in particular, use them as ways to either compel or exclude uh, men or women from certain activities or occupations. And I think that's where the difference is. I think that's where the sensible difference is. I don't. The sensible difference is not between people who think biology doesn't matter at all, there are no differences between men and women, and to say otherwise is to be patriarchal, or the people who say biology is everything, women should just be mothers, right. look at them, right. they've, got, they've, got womb, they've got wombs, let's keep them away from the right, workplace, of course. Right, right, right. right, right. The, the sensible argument is like, how much should it matter, right? How much, how much weight um, should, we, should we give it? And labor law is a good example. And you've mentioned Marianne Glendon already, who's one of your, I guess, if Wollstonecraft's your earlier hero, Glendon's your later hero. And in particular, the work that she does versus, I guess, other I mean, people not in the same time period, but maybe you know, Florence Kelly and some of these people who, who the difference in the feminist movement in attitudes towards labor law in particular, which as I read those chapters of your book are really about should women be treated differently or should they be treated the same? Um, and Glendon says differently. Can you talk a little bit about that? that, that I know it's a, it's a huge subject, but just like what's, the, what's at stake in that, in that uh, conversation? Yeah, so I think that Glendon wouldn't say immediately differently. So I think that, um, you know, she would agree like I do with um, Ginsburg's early 1970s um, work, which basically says that, you know, women should be equally protected um, in terms of um, workplace, you know, discrimination, that, that, th those kinds of uh, issues um, when there's no reason to distinguish between men and women, right? And so we're not, when well, we're not talking about reproductive differences, 
um, I think Ginsburg's work is right on, you know, that why would you say that women as a class should be kept from a particular line of work or from particular education because they have the potential to become mothers? That just does not, you know, that doesn't accord well with Wollstonecraft or Mill or Ginsburg or Glendon, uh, kind of some of the key players in the book, right? Hmm. Um, and so the difference then becomes what to do with the, the asymmetries, right? The reproductive asymmetries. So the basic fact that women and men can engage in the same sexual act, and we talked about some about the desire and differences in desires, but that women can become pregnant and men can't. So what do you do about that fact? And, um, and that's where, you know, uh, things become um, interesting, right? Because for, for Ginsburg, you have the real push for an understanding of equal citizenship that includes, um, includes abortion rights at its very, very kind of uh, center, right? And you have someone like um, Glendon and myself, and for that matter, Wollstonecraft, although of course she predates anything like equal protection law, <laughs> um, who would say, actually, um, you're taking uh, you know, the male as normative in that view of citizenship. You're saying that, you know, because men can walk away from an unintended pregnancy, the way to make women equal is by saying that they should be able to, quote, walk away too. The problem is, is that they can't just walk away. They have to engage in private killing, right? And so the better way would be the way the first wave or the early, you know, the uh, mid-19th century um, women's movement thought about this, which was to um, instead of, you know, saying sexual equality is, you know, imitating men in their ability to walk away, it's instead demanding that men meet women at this kind of high standard of mutual responsibility, reciprocity and care. And so that doesn't at all, it doesn't only include, you know, men then being involved with children when they are conceived and then born, but it also carries backward. And that's what I talk a lot about is to living lives of self-mastery, learning to live sexual integrity from their youth. And that's a real big Wollstonecraft theme, right? Mm. You know, if you have like a Margaret Sanger who locates all the issues at um, on women, you know, women's fertility is really the issue um, that we have to manage. And so she wants to manage it with contraception and, you know, and, and we could talk about kind of the fallout of all that and how it gets us to, to abortion. But for Wollstonecraft and those early 19, uh, 18th century, uh, sorry, 19th century feminists, the issue is the want of male chastity, as she says. You know, so that's where we should be focusing our attention is, yes, men have a more difficult uh, time, you know, managing um, their, their uh, sort of stronger libido, but that that's where um, women can really be uh, treated with dignity and... Um, real reciprocity and care is by asking men to, to take seriously um, the self-mastery they have around sex. Mm. So, I, and I, I think there's a lot to that. I think that the um, one question is a sort of a, pr a practical one, which is in you know, a world where the vast majority of people will engage in sex before marriage is what, do you, how do you think about that? And that's not really a new thing. Um, it's probably happened a bit more, but I'm thinking about June. I think it's June Carbon had this great statistic that in 1960, 30 percent of the first births uh, to married couples took place in less than nine minutes, nine months rather than after the marriage. Right. So right. and Scott Winship's work over at JEC shows that the decline in shotgun marriages actually explains is the biggest factor explaining the rise in non-marital births. So it's not like people weren't having sex before marriage. Right. It's just that. And well, the, the automobile, norm, right, the is the first. Yeah, right. the automobile, the, norm. the first, the first wave of the of the sexual revolution <laughs> is the ability and to I, be alone together. Right. And one of the things, exactly. Yeah, there's good evidence of that. I think one of the things that strikes me though is uh, you jump, I think, quite quickly over contraception um, to abortion and say that it's kind of a, that the right to abortion is what's changed or changed things here. It's changed employers' attitudes. It's changed the law, and that's the sort of epitome of this individualized, autonomous um, world. Whereas I think most people would say, well, Bill Clinton would, would once have said, you know, abortion should be legal, safe and rare. And I think most people would say that the, the most productive thing to do is think about contraception. And we know that more effective forms of contraception have significantly reduced abortion rates in Delaware, for example, places where there's just like a lot more contraception and more availability. You do reduce abortion, as you'd expect. Um, and so it seems to me like that if anything's made parenting into more of a choice or pregnancy into more of a choice contraception is a bigger part of the story it's not that abortion isn't part of the story but for most people right it's access to contraception from the pill onwards and now long-acting reversible contraception and so on which my colleague bell sawhill's written about and so so it just strikes me just jump a little bit too quickly 
past that. And the problem that conservatives have is that they're against very often they're against both. And so it actually makes it quite difficult to make a strong argument, an anti-abortion argument for contraception in a world where people are going to have sex, maybe not as much or in the way that, you know, you and I might both not like, but, but they are. And uh, and so break the link between sex and pregnancy. And the way you do that is through effective contraception. But a lot of people are against that as well, which leads you to a position where it's like, I really just want people to have sex within marriage, which even if it's intellectually coherent, seems seems naive to use a word that you used about Mill earlier. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so let me get because I actually don't know anyone. They're probably out there. I grant you that that thinks that contraception should be illegal or unavailable, or even that like Griswold should be overturned. Like I don't, or if they think Griswold should be overturned, it's for like you know constitutional law reasons. Mm. It's not because they think like you know ban the contraception or something. Obviously, there are many, many people Catholics um, who think it's immoral. But let's kind of get at the story I do tell, um, because I think it's an important one. Um, and that is that, you know, obviously, when the pill comes about, the idea of the pill, um, and, you know, we don't have to get into the eugenics background, obviously, for Sanger, and for the population control advocates, you know, there's a there's a there's a desire to you know, lessen um, overpopulation, especially among, you know, whatever, the, the you know, those who would, yeah. would, you know, the eugenic category. Didn't pass but, Sanger's test. No, no, sure. Right, right, right. Okay. Moving beyond that, though, um, because certainly people who want the pill aren't all eugenicists at all at this time. So I would, uh, you know, so, but what the pill does is it inspires this change in sexual behavior. And that's where what I don't think was at least anticipated by those who pushed for it. And so you have, obviously, you know, if you believe that the pill will make, ensure that, you know, no pregnancy will come about, then obviously, um, you know, people are going to engage in sex, not more sex inside of marriage, but also outside of marriage. And just as a parenthetical, this is exactly the worry that the 19th century women's rights advocates had about contraception. So, you know, they're really nascent forms of contraception at that time, you know, teas, whatever. And yeah. so their view is that this is going to, the splitting sex and um, reproduction is going to ensure that men are wayward and go visit prostitutes more. And they saw this as very, very bad for women. So this is not like, uh, this is a very old argument in some sense, um, the worry about the pill that I don't think, you know, those who created the pill really understood kind of what we would call like the moral hazard effect, right? So there's this little incentive to guard against the risk, um, uh, to guard against it with, you know, self-mastery, which is what these, with what Wollstonecraft and the, and the um, 19th century women's rights advocates wanted. So you have this technology that protects, protects against pregnancy. You don't really need self-mastery. And so you can go outside of marriage and have sex. And so there's this increase in sexual risk-taking, what we would call sexual risk-taking, right? And so then there's this spike in non-marital, non-marital birth rate, because there's obviously no access, not as much access to abortion, or it's illegal at that point. And so you have this shot up from single, in single motherhood from like 5% in 1960 to like 40% a couple decades later, which I would say is a result of the pill, right? And then you have abortion, which the pill was meant to prevent, right? Those illegal abortions mm -hmm. or those desperate abortions, um, you have abortion then on the table. So the, those, you know, population control people didn't want abortion at first. They thought this, you know, the pill was a prophylactic. It's going to work to reduce the abortion rate. Well, now you have the need for legal abortion because you have all these unintended pregnancies because people are having more sex. So that's the way that people kind of think about it is because of this moral hazard. Now, the way I, because, you know, it's not 100% effective in preventing pregnancy. Granted, that's why you need abortion. Everybody agrees <laughs> on both sides of the issue that that's necessary, right? In terms of why, what the argument for abortion is for. Um, and so from my perspective, the better way about this would not be to like reduce contraception in any way, but it would be to reduce abortion. So from your perspective, you have, you use more contraception, therefore the abortion rate goes down. And I would mm -hmm. say, okay, that may be so, except for that you have to get to pe get people to use contraception, right? Mm -hmm. And the way you get to use, get people to use contraception is reducing abortion because the more abortion you have, the easier it is to have abor uh, abortions, then the less likely people are going to be to contracept, right? To take to take basically what sex is as mm -hmm. potentially you know producing, um, you know, a child, <laughs> conceiving a child. They're going to take that more seriously, and so that's where I would say you know, and and so think of um, uh, you have Alan Guttmacher, right? Who's uh, one of the founders of not one of the founders, second you know second there president of Planned Parenthood, and he has these great quotes where he says at the beginning, you know, 
when a, because Planned Parenthood wasn't on board for this liberal abortion yet. It was for contraception as a way to prevent abortion um, in the, you know, in the first case. So they, so he says when an abortion is easily obtainable, contraception is neither actively nor diligently used. Um, and I mean, I think that's, you know, quite out, <laughs> quite outstanding. I think that that's exactly what happened. So that's why from my perspective, I mean, obviously I think that, you know, the ch- child in the womb deserves protection, but I think you mm. limit abortion and you don't call it a right. And so that's also the problem is that a right to private killing just constitutionally speaking, morally speaking, doesn't make sense. But you basically say that there's a legitimate claim to self-defense in some cases, right? And proportionally, what does that mean? But allowing abortion in some way, in some cases is not the same, same thing as saying I have a right to non-procreative sex. And if I end up procreating, I have a right to private killing. And that's a very different way of kind of organizing the argument than the way kind of our, you know, the left and right are having it today, I think. So it's, in, I mean, there's both an ethical question here and an empirical one, it seems to me. So the, the empirical, and I think you've made your ethical position clear, the empirical one, I think, uh, in you know the world where we are is to say, so I think most people could agree that it's better that we should keep the distinction between contraception and abortion. You don't want to end up like the Soviet, former Soviet Union where, I don't know, the you know, average woman is having four abortions or something. And, and, it, and it was, I think, genuinely seen as a kind of form of contraception. Um, so I think keeping that distinction, then the empirical question becomes like you've made you, your claim an empirical claim is that if abortion is more available, people will use contraception less. Um, my claim is that if contraception is more available, it will reduce the abortion rate. So I think it's easier to prove. It's easier to prove my. I'm not saying your claim is wrong. I'm just saying it's easier to prove mine than yours, and it has been kind of proven. But I am just kind of wondering. I mean, is just as an empirical question, I'm not. I'm not convinced empirically that people will contracept less if abortion is available because i thought it sort of presumes in some way that that people are okay with it um and, and, and that people are sort of you have this there's this sort of view of the individual saying i'm gonna have sex and oh if the contraception doesn't work it doesn't matter i can have an abortion and i just don't think many people really think like that i think that for the vast majority of, of people and obviously i'm speaking about this as a man right and so it, there's very big limits but but from my from my experience you know indirect experience with friends and so on abortion is very rarely a, a thing that women take even those who are very pro-choice take us you know, lightly. Um, I think very yeah. people would say it's optimal. They'd always see it as suboptimal and they'd be like, I wish I'd used contraception more. I wish I hadn't slept, whatever. whatever. And so it's always seen as a bit of a, a last resort. And so I'm not sure necessarily that making it harder to obtain will have the effects on contraception that you suggest. Yeah. So, so think about, and you know, I just have the theory like Richard Posner saying similar things to Alan Gottmacher, right? So I don't, I mean, I think you could also say, I want to get to what happened in Texas, but um, yeah. you could also say that um, with the abortion rate going down, you know, both the left and right. And I think, you know, Bell sa- says this in her book, um, Generation Unbound, where and I think this is exactly right. And you have people um, um, now I'm forgetting his name on the right who who make this argument. Um, but the idea that, you know, with the pro- more pro-life measures in states since Casey, the abortion rate has gone down. Why? Because And there is empirics on this. And I, you know, have that mm. in, um, in footnotes where um, people are taking, you know, sex more seriously and therefore reducing their kind of sexual risk taking. The other thing, and so therefore leading to less abortion. The other thing I would say is like, look at some of the reactions of people after the Texas law, you know, this, this six week ban or ban after six weeks where people, and maybe this is just Twitter, but there's people saying like, sex strike, make sure you get your contraception. Like, oh my gosh, you know? And so you wonder like, well, why, why are they saying that? Like, in other words, in Europe, where there's less access to abortion mm-hmm. in many in many Western countries, I mean, there's less access to abortion in most places in the world um, where, you know, really an outlier, there's people using two forms of contraception. So people are, what I'm saying is that they take it much more seriously because you don't have this backstop that's there. But then there's the whole issue. I mean, there's all sorts of other issues. So with something like the IUD or the, you know, the long acting reversible contraception, mm-hmm. you have the issue I mentioned about, um, and this is something that Robin West sees very well, Catherine McKinnon saw very well, that it just then, you know, if women are sort of infertile, the default is infertile, well, then they're always available for sex. And so you have the other problem with casual sex, 
um, and and how that affects women emotionally and how that affects relationships. If there's lots of casual sex, the data I've seen says harder for those people, especially who have had lots of casual sex, lots of sexual partners, marriage and commitment within marriage becomes much more difficult um, to sustain. So there's, you know, that kind of that kind of well, thing of well, yeah. and then I haven't even gotten to sort of the workplace norms. No, you know, when you let's have talk about like a Bloomberg. Yeah, you know, you have let's... like a Bloomberg saying, you know, like, oh my gosh, all these women are pregnant on my payroll. Well, aren't they, why don't they just go kill it? You know, so there's this way in which when when you have this legal fiction that, you know, and you treat, you know, you treat the unborn child who we know is a child from science and ultrasounds and, um, you know, it's another human being. When you treat that in kind of this way in which you can say there, you can allow private killing for any reason that a woman would want, then of course people aren't going to take that child as, in serious need of, um, as sort of dignifying, um, uh, 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 you know, the care that women give it in, give that child in pregnancy. And so more pregnancy discrimination, rampant pregnancy discrimination still, I mean, it's on, you know, well past, um, well after, you know, mm-hmm. 50 years into the women's movement, uh, row, et cetera. So I think that there's, again, there's a spillover when you have these kind of norms, um, then it spills over into the way that everybody thinks about the unborn child and the responsibilities that women have to those children and that men have to those children. You know, um, there's the great, you know, the the argument that that Janet Yellen and, and George Akerlof, you uh, you know, make that you know Brookings um, publish on your site about mm. when you make the when you make the birth of the child the physical choice of the mother, marriage and child support become the social choice of the father. You know, okay, if you can kill our child, well, I don't have to pay for it. You know, or whatever, I don't have to be present there to to. Engaged well, it, yeah, in, in, and there was also the, yeah. what's it? Uh, Sh- got Goldschneider talking about financial abortion, you know, way back when, and how men should be able to sort of choose to get rid of their financial obligations right. uh, and yeah. so on. So that's to an extreme. But let's let's talk about where I think there's more agreement, um, not only between you and me, but I think between you and many people on the current you know, left, which is not, not necessarily where I position myself. But but I think what's interesting about this is. You have this, uh, there's an argument that runs through your book, where, which is that as if pregnancy is just a, a lifestyle choice, if access to contraception and abortion and, and you know, changes in norms around that means like, well, it's just a choice. That means that we won't properly support families. We won't properly support mothers and fathers. We won't change workplaces. We won't give them childcare. We won't, you know, we won't give them the financial support. It, it, it'll be against familism. It's basically, well, you, you chose to, you chose to have the baby in the same way you chose to have a new DVD player. Not my problem, right? And employers, you make that argument. And I think the, you know, the argument feels intellectually quite strong, but it doesn't seem to me to survive contact with the political world as we see it. So it's the old barb about, you know, conservatives are the people that believe that life begins at conception and ends at birth. And when I look at what the Biden administration is doing, for example, right, and come out very strongly for the very strict Texas law, you know, very progressive on issues around, you know, abortion, et cetera. And I think we can, I think we can agree that both sides can go to extremes on this, at least. Um, at the same time, throwing trillions of dollars at parents, pushing for, for more child care, pushing for federal pay, paid leave policies, all of which you support, et cetera. Um, and when I read your policy chapters around paid, I think I could be reading Heather Boucher, who's in the Council of Economic Advisors and, and you know, has written all that. I'm like, oh, this is Heather, right? Uh, and so in practice, it seems that it's not true that the people who are strongly pro-abortion uh, are actually anti-family. It seems like it's the other way around when I look at the Biden. And meanwhile, trying to get conservatives to throw money at families and have a massive paid leave program and 12 months of maternity leave and all of that. It's impossible. It's always possible. So it doesn't seem like that's true in practice, does it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that there's all sorts of possibility of really scrambling categories. And this is why I think if you overturn Roe, and actually Joan Williams makes this argument, I can't remember if it was in the New York Times, but she says, you know, we spent so much time fighting for Roe. If we let Roe go, that there's lots of political categories that would be scrambled and we could really do more negotiating and settling things for women, for poor women at the state level. And I think that's absolutely right. I think there's so many ways in which I agree with people on the left. Now we can get to, you know, the difference between like daycare and just giving vouchers. I mean, I tend to be more in support of, of, um, you know, giving, um, money and let, and allowing, you know, 
mothers and fathers to decide who will care for their children, then giving, then, you know, flooding the market with just daycare and, and sending children into, into the care of others. Um, though, of course, I think that should be an absolute choice um, yeah. for people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, that that's kind of the problem right now is that everybody's like their heels are stuck in about, you know, whether abortion is a constitutional right. And then we can't, you know, because I think it is so damaging both to the republic in terms of how we've used the Supreme Court to de- determine this. Um, so in terms of constitutional law, in terms of, you know, not taking seriously uh, the care of um, that's necessary for the child because it is a child. I mean, all these different things. Um, I, that's where I'm going to stay first because kind of that right to life of that child and the duties of care owed to that child and that are owed to the mother and the father are first, right? But then once we get out of that discussion, I tend to like, you know, fly over much more to kind of economic, um, uh, I don't know if I would call myself an economic liberal, but certainly I would want to see the state very much involved in care and making sure that families have support, um, much, much more support, because we tend so libertarian in that way. We tend to sort of see, you know, the market, the state and the individual, and we forget all about the family that makes, you know, the world go around, <laughs> that every other economic, social and political um, good are are there because of, of what, you know, mothers and fathers do in, in the home. And so, yes, I, I agree. And I, but I think there are, I mean, that's what makes a social conservative different from like a libertarian, right? Is that there's plenty of social conservatives who, I mean, look at Romney's um, proposal, I think is, is very strong. And he's a social conservative, you know, he used to be, I think, a libertarian, I'm not sure, you know, whether, why he's changing his mind on that, but it seems to be that he's shifted in that. Um, so I think there are, there are people like a Marco Rubio, there are people who, um, you know, you may not like their views on other things, but on this, on family, I mean, this to me, again, is somewhere where it seems to me that left and right, um, at least towards the center, um, could come together or social conservatives and people, um, and, you know, liberals could come together, especially in supporting the family. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the question is, on on what grounds does that agreement Mm -hmm. take, take place? And, And I think the the problem and thinking about European countries, for example, you know, the, 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 if the issue of abortion remains the sort of rallying cry of both left and right, um, right. and, and basically the battle is, you know, the, the social conservatives won't stop until it's completely illegal and the liberals won't stop until it's completely free for everybody, you know, under any circumstances, then this will just go on forever. And what actually right, most right. What European countries have done is to find a settlement which is you know closer to what you've said, which is to certainly not to encourage it, to see it more as a last resort, you know, et cetera. And to some extent, take the political heat, you know, political heat out of it. And then let's go on to That's the family right. policy. So, but That's I do right. sort of slightly worry that it it will take both sides to 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 sort of down downgrade their expectations as to what's possible in order to meet somewhere in the middle and right now i just see each side there's a sort of centripetal a centrifugal i can never remember but they're pushing each other away and the more one yeah. side becomes the more so you see the reaction to texas and then and it just gets worse and whereas in fact there's like, there is a, there is probably a place where actually where most americans are which is there should be restrictions on it it's not ideal you know most people think probably six weeks is kind of restrictive because of you know how how long it takes to even find out you're pregnant but very few people were in favor of on demand and so i just wonder if i slightly worry just how much emphasis you're placing on abortion whether that whether that actually gets in the way of the kind of bipartisan agreement on other areas of policy that that we might otherwise find do you worry about that at all yeah no i think that's i i can see that that being a problem but i think that it um because I think that Roe and Casey are impediments to the kinds, oh, not I think, that it's just true that Roe and Casey are impediments to the kind of restrictions that most Americans, it sounds like you would even be in favor of, then that's why the, they need to go in order to, you know, avail states of the the possibility of, of making um, restrictions on abortion. And so, you know, obviously, if Roe and Casey go, you, I live in Massachusetts, so you still have, um, you know, lots of, uh, you know, liberal abortion laws. And then in Texas, you'll have, you know, much more limitations on abortion. And so where am I going to spend more time, um, you know, fighting abortion in Massachusetts or making sure Texans have, you know, good family policy? <laughs> and it seems to me that we have to be doing both. Um, but but that, um, you know, one thing that, that kind of aggravates me is that there is already in places like Texas um, supports for mothers and families. Um, in fact, I have a friend who just wrote an article about it in, in, in Newsweek 
Um, and yet those are kind of ignored. You know, there's something called, um, uh, you know, the the uh, Texas Alternatives to Abortion A2A, which was passed long before the passage of this heart bill, heartbeat bill, which provides tons and tons of support. So, yes, I agree that Texas is, you know, isn't particularly generous in terms of social supports for, for, for families generally. But in terms of this bill, there's lots of good that's happening. So I do think that there's a way in which our politics do in part to Twitter, <laughs> do in part to just, you know, not wanting to be canceled by your own side or something like that. In terms of our culture, we're having a lot, a lot of a really a hard time kind of meeting um, part way and, and discussing these things. Um, mm. And again, I mean, I also have to go back to the part that I really think that when you when you devalue um, the child in the womb, you're, dev- you're devaluing what pregnancy is. And so it's not for me just an issue of, um, you know, meeting halfway, but it's really saying that there are moral demands upon us that I think need to be recognized in law for the sake of the child as well. Yeah, I understand that. And I think that's a, an ethical position, which uh, is, is, in some ways, it's, just a, it's not dissolvable, right? You got, that doesn't change. That's a sort of piece of rock, basically. And in your thinking, for me, it's more, I guess, it's more of a political point, which is I, I worry from both sides that if it's if it's a kind of abortion first politics um that that will make it harder and harder to get anyone on the other side to agree with you because um you know the, the left will always say well if you supported family policy and if you were actually in, in favor of helping families right. and then maybe maybe i'd listen to you but you just seem obsessed with this issue and vice versa frankly and so it's it's the abortion firstness of u.s politics in yep. this space anyway yep. i think it, it i just you know, as an observation just genuinely militates against trying to find some some space and what it uh, to agree on other things and what it requires unfortunately is because it's such a deep issue for a lot of people on both sides um it requires people to sort of um put it down a little bit you know try and tone down the rhetoric around something that feel very strongly right. i mean david french was on and he you know quoted ginsburg saying he thought roe versus wade wasn't very well decided and so this whole area is is a, is a kind of horrible, a horrible mess anyway. But the other thing I just wanted to push on a little bit, and I'm conscious of, uh, of kind of time, um, so maybe this is maybe where we should go just as a last thought. So the question about the differences in reproductive, the reproductive asymmetry between men and women, they're different, and so we have to treat them differently. I, I was re Margaret Mead was on my desk today because of what I'm writing about, and she said, we won't get equality between groups by ignoring the differences between them. And she was referring to women and men, and and I think you point out that Ginsburg didn't Ginsburg didn't think about sex the same way she thought about race. You recognise there were differences. The question is how far does that go? So maternity leave, sure, but after that, it seems to me that you want paid leave that either fathers or mothers can take, even if in practice mothers do take more of it, um, mm-hmm. or something like the draft. I have to ask you about that as well. That's the other thing that's, that's happened. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think you maybe you mentioned the draft, but of course that's now no, changed, no. right? So we've now we're now moving towards women being able to be drafted into the the military. And previously, the argument would have been a reproductive asymmetry one against that, which would have been well. In fact, that's what Josh Hawley just said. He says I'm against this because. I don't want our wives, daughters, and mothers to be forced to go and fight. And so whenever conservatives are against the draft, they always use that language. They always, they always make the relational point, right, which is their mothers, particularly, right, are we going to send mothers? What's your response to, to the change in, in the law? Does that meet your test? or? You know, I have to say that I have not spent any time looking at, I don't, didn't even know Josh, Josh Hawley said that, so I'm yeah. going to have they to always say leave. It. I mean, but it's, I, what, it's what they yeah, always yeah, say, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I can understand, you know, like, if you remember um, the arguments that, like, Louis Brandeis made in in the chapter on protective labor legislation, that there is a way in which, and this is just literally speaking off the cuff without knowing uh, the argument, um, not as much of a policy wonk as, as, uh, as, I, am, <laughs> as I am more of a <laughs> legal theorist. So I don't really keep up on this stuff at all, um, at least, you know, in these kinds of areas. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, the fact that women um, are the ones uh, who bear the children who make civilization kind of go round, right? We don't want them all to be dead. Of course, they're not all going to be dead because not every woman is going to go into the, go into the military. There's also a way in which you can, would you have women not on the front lines of combat so that, you know, they're actually going to be around to mm. have children if you were in a horrible war and all the women are gone and then you couldn't actually reproduce yourself. Like, that's a real question, right? So that's the way I would have argued, um, you know. I guess the, the the way I would answer, though, the other question, which I think is really important, and I don't think I got to it because you had asked it a bit in a different way before, is that I, I agree, yes, that um, I would want to see st- kind of um, 
uh, an equality that did not differentiate between men and women when it didn't come to reproduction. But what I wouldn't want to do is have something like, um, say, the Equal Rights Amendment, which I talk a bit about there in, uh, in the book, and then I pull out for, for an article in um, National Affairs, mm. where, the, where the Supreme Court could strike down laws um, based on moving um, you know, equal protection jurisprudence when it comes to sex from intermediate scrutiny to strict scrutiny um, if they didn't, if a law didn't treat men and women the same. So my worry is exactly what you said. So you make a law that allows, you know, the uptake of family leave benefits for both men and women, but then men don't take it up nearly as much as women. And so the, is there a way that a man then has some sort of claim against this law because of, you know, something like that? Um, so that's my worry is that, yes, you should allow, and that's what Ginsburg wanted in some sense is this. Yep. She wanted this... Um, uh, corridor, she said, in which the legislature could move when, when it comes to the differences between men and women. So I don't want the, I think that what we have right now in terms of our jurisprudence is really good because it looks askance at those laws that treat men and women differently, but then it allows this corridor for the legislature to work in order to say, yes, maternity leave at a, you know, at, at the minimum because men and women are different when it comes mm -hmm. to having a child. Um, but then with regard to family policy, if women are taking up, you know, those kinds of benefits more than men, because in this million sense, they're choosing to care for children, because that's what they want to be doing, that should be allowed, right? I mean, we shouldn't in any way say, no, we need to have this kind of strict market equality in which men and women are doing the exact amount of kind of market work and the exact amount of work at home. I don't think anyone really wants that, although you can sometimes hear that in some more, um, you know, feminists who really want to urge a more kind of, um, you know, making sure kind of men participate at home in order that women can have marked equality. And my view is men should participate at home because it's good for men and good for children and good for women, right? R regardless of whether women are entering the workplace on a full-time basis or at that ki at those kind of competitive levels that, that um, their counterpart in the home is doing. So that to me is the better argument is that mm -hmm. home is always first and the market is there is always parasitic on the home, as I always put it, you know, that that what the work of the home is the more important for both men and women to be engaged in that home, in that work. And whatever work they're doing outside the home is, to me, secondary. It's important. It, I love my work outside the home, um, but it's secondary to the because of the responsibilities we have to each other in our marriages and, and with our children. So I think, again, again, I'm hearing a lot of Heather Boucher um, around workplaces and so on. And I've often I've been I, 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 get, I agree with you about workplaces and I think Claudia Golden who you cite would too which is we're we're always promised family friendly work places but what we actually end up with is work friendly families and so for example I really worry for where you know colleagues will just say oh well we just need to extend the school day to match the work day right right and, and my argument about that as I've said this publicly I was always like well are you sure that's the right way to go are we quite sure that the solution to the problem that the work, school day and work day don't align is to make kids stay in school for 10 hours. I'm not, especially when they're young, I'm not sure. Why should we just presume that the model of the market so should apply? To, and, I, and I do think the result of that can be an underinvestment in families. I also think that other things equal, men and women may well make different choices at different stages, particularly their kids' lives, right. but, but the distributions will overlap. And so the key, the key point here is never look, look on average. It's just to allow for the, and this is Ginsburg's point, which I think you're fair about, which is, look, in the Virginia Military Institute kind of cases, like, yes, but there are going to be like, what if there's a guy, what if I, I did, I stayed home for quite a while, for a few years, for mm -hmm. example, when our mm -hmm. kids were young, right? And I would like a policy apparatus that was as supportive of my right my ability as a father to stay at home and raise my kids while my wife right. was in the labor market, as vice versa. I, I, what I didn't want to find was that, well, if I'd been a woman, I could have taken 12 months paid leave, but I'm not. Right. So, exactly. Like, we're no, trying to avoid absolutely. that, right? We want, so the reproductive asymmetry, I think, is quite, uh, it's quite narrowly defined. It's particularly around maternity and the very first months after that. So like, if, if you were to ask me, you've got a mum and a dad, and one of them's unfortunately going to die, this maybe comes to the the point about the dispensable males and the draft, right? Let's say the kid is, is six weeks old. Is it better if the mom survives or the dad and the mom? Six months, the mom. A year, the mom. 10 years old, 15 years old. It's not clear to me. So, so at a certain point, the reproductive asymmetry 
can become right. a, no, a way I'm to corral people into roles, right? So it's so mm-hmm. maternity leave, yes. And so if the Equal Rights Amendment like threatened maternity leave problem, or or if it threatened the ability of men and women to make different choices under similar circumstances, that would be a, right. a problem. So I think we, we'd end up agreeing uh, about that. But the Equal Rights Amendment's yeah, no, not going, right. go, going anywhere anyway, is it? I mean, it's no, it's, it's not. <laughs> Didn't they even keep Gin- bringing it back about, but yeah. Didn't even Ginsburg <laughs> Right, Ginsburg say. even said that. Yeah, start all start all over. Yeah, I just think, and, and there's some people, again, I can't, I know I'm forgetting the Stanford professor who said, like, let's stop trying to push this through and, like, let's work on the family policy. Let's get going at the state level, you know, and why not, why aren't we doing that? So I think we're spending a lot of time um, sometimes, as you've said, and I think that's right, um, fighting these kind of wars that are kind of rhetorical and in order to gain points instead of actually to really you know, work together for especially the good of, of poor women, children, poor families, you know, men who want work, who can't find it um, so that they can care for their families. Um, those kinds of problems, I think, are things that from across the aisle, we can be working on together. And, um, you know, I quote you all sorts of places mm-hmm. through the book. I mm-hmm. think I quote exactly that part about uh, the family friendly workplaces and the work for fam- friendly oh, right. families. Okay. I think that's in a footnote somewhere. Is it? Oh, yeah, I, no, I, I love your, I love your work on that. And I'm very eager to see your work on boys because I, um, I really, uh, I think that, you know, you have so much good to say in, in all of this. So I'm, I'm eager to see that. Well, thank you. I think that the issue is not just finding the middle ground, but, but making it because people get dug in. And I think part of this is my sense is that there's this like there is this kind of air you know air war going on uh, about issues like abortion and the equal rights amendment and i don't know trans bathrooms right. you know and, and, and that's and 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 i'm not casting blame on one side i think each side just pushes the other to their worst success and then meanwhile you just find these people who are trying to raise their families and get on with their lives who are generally pretty tolerant and you know just it just there's some there's this, the disconnect between the shibboleths of modern culture politics and the concerns of people and i think both yeah, sides right. are really missing it missing that that's really what makes that's why mind. I really stay out of the policy walk stuff because I find that it tends to just I mean trying to keep up with the news cycle is impossible you know I have my own family I try to you know keep my head down and think about those places and try to work with people so I run you know we're trying to figure out what to do with ourselves now but something called the both and coalition which is basically mm. saying like how can we make sure that states that do restrict abortion are working on um, these kinds of family policies like what's the way in which we can get the state involved in a way that you know, maybe not all the way to the extent of Europe. I don't know that Americans could handle that. <laughs> but but why not bring um, like liberals aboard something like that and start to sit and talk, even if it's behind closed doors and no one wants, you know, their name associated with it or something. I've mm. seen that happen where I've got great conversations going with someone and I won't, you know, won't say who because it seems like she doesn't want her name out there. But and then I publish something and she doesn't like it. And therefore, we're not allowed to talk anymore because she's getting people calling her saying you're having conversations with her, you know? So that to me is so sad. Like there's so much that you and I and Brad Wilcox and, and people on um, other people on the right, you know, I haven't read Heather Boucher's work, but I'm sure I would love it um, are doing to like come together. Um, There's uh, uh, people at Harvard who are starting to talk about this as Mm. well. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if it's behind closed doors, I don't care if it's behind open doors, that doesn't matter to me because I don't really care reputationally about that as much, but um, I think it's yeah. important work to do. Um, and, and, you know, there were people, I think like yourself and Brad Wilcox who were, who have been doing it for a long time. And so it's trying to, um, muster the courage to keep going, especially maybe on this issue of abortion where people, I think even on some people on the right don't even want to touch it, um, because they feel like it gets in the way too. So, but there are well, ways, uh, yeah, I think, the, politi- if, the political, you know, I think the political risks for the, for the, the right, are you know, David Frum wrote a piece about this, I think, uh, that's right. of, uh, you know, are, are non-trivial, um and again it's this because of the pushes to the extremes and so on um right. that people kind of feel which is not the way the way europe went but i i, I agree i think that i'd like to think that sort of the venn diagram if you think about a venn diagram where people's interests overlap and if we could spend more time in the places where they overlap and a bit less time in the places where they don't that would be better and not and whilst respecting the places where they don't overlap i think that the That's key right. thing is just say okay i i get i get it that's where you are um, that's, I'm never going to be there. That's off the table. Let's just find a way to at least kind of take the, but look, here is where we, we, we do agree, but we have a politics right now where it, we just ignore the overlap or if we have to do so it's quietly and we all spend up, we spend our bits of the time in the Venn, bits of the Venn diagram 
that are separate to each other rather than the bits that overlap. And I'm not suggesting you don't need both, but I worry that the emphasis is like on where, what do, what, where do we disagree? And of course, there's a good million, right? Disagreement can be helpful because it elucidates more clarity right. and like, as I hope this conversation has. But, but I want to applaud you for your work. Um, we've found plenty to disagree about and uh, agree about, but there is an intellectual integrity to it. You're calling it as you see it. This is what you believe. This is what you think the implications are. And, and I think that kind of moral clarity is hugely helpful because it illuminates what follows. And I think the to just be clear about this is where I come from morally it makes it just for a much richer and better conversation. So thank you for your work. Thank you for, and most, did you know that Wollstonecraft has a Twitter account, by the way, you probably do know this, but so is that, Ooh, I'm not sure if yeah. I know that. Do, yeah. I don't know. Who, is that what it is? I, I okay. wondered if it was you or it's some, someone no, no, no. quite fun. There's quite a funny, <laughs> there's quite a funny Wollstonecraft Twitter account, which we'll link to and you should have a look at it. But for bringing her work back up, I think that she was a really neglected figure. Uh, and, and I think you have done a, a really, a really good public service in bringing her the richness of her thought more to light. So thank you for that. And thank you for today. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Dialogues. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. And if you did, please take a moment to follow, like, rate and share the podcast in all the usual places. And send me your thoughts and ideas, including for future guests, to dialoguespod at gmail.com. That's dialoguespod at gmail.com. I'll see you next time.